Hi, welcome back. Um, so today on Deep Cuts, we have Stephen Kinzer joining us. He is the author of All the Shah's Men, An American Coup, and the Roots of Middle East Terror. The book is about Iranian Prime Minister, Mos Minister Mosaddegh and his overthrow in 1953, which was organized by U.S. and British intelligence uh, under President Eisenhower and Winston Churchill. The coup came after a years-long battle between Mosaddegh's government and the Anglo-Iranian oil company, now known as British Petroleum, uh, to nationalize Iran, Iran's oil. This event led to the oppressive regime of the Shah, which ultimately then led to the 1979 Islamic Revolution and the rise of Ayatollah Khomeini. Today we're going to talk about the details of the 1953 coup, about how it came about, the players involved, and what the consequences have been of this drastic foreign policy decision which resound to this day. So thank you so much for uh, joining us, Stephen. Always great to spread the word about this uh, most important but not so widely understood historical episode. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, I did not know about this coup until actually after college. Um, so it's something that we're definitely not taught about in school, but it has so many ramifications. Had and, and I want to give some credit to, to Bernie Sanders. I actually think the first person who said, you know, in the last 30 years said the word Mossadegh out loud to general American public would have to be Senator Sanders. I almost fell off my chair when I heard Sanders say, Mohammed Mossadegh, Prime Minister of Iran. <laughs> Nobody's ever heard of Mossadegh. <laughs> It, it came on in his debate with uh, Hillary Clinton, and then he went on from there. I tell you something, it was a shock to me. Mossadegh made it into the mainstream of American politics as he should have made it a long time before. So yes, I agree. I tip my hand to Bernie on that one. He must have been reading my book. That's a, that's a good... <laughs> That's a good Bernie impression. We, we do a lot of those methods, around but here. I, so I can do the voice. You're, you're in the running. Um, so first, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the background, uh, how Mossadegh came to power. So can you tell us a little bit about what it was like on the ground? What was the Anglo-Iranian oil company, uh, now British Petroleum, what were they doing? Why was what they were doing unfair? And how did Mossadegh start to get this uh, really populist uh, gigantic following in the country. The uh, people of Iran had been struggling since their constitutional revolution right after uh, 1900 to establish democracy. They hadn't really succeeded in consolidating a democracy. Then during the Second World War, Iran was occupied by Allied forces. But by the time the war ended and after the Allies left, it was finally possible for Iranians to go back to their original constitution and pick up where they left off and try to consolidate a real democracy. Uh, from that process emerged this remarkable figure, Mohammad Mossadegh. He was already an elderly figure then. He was, came from very sophisticated background and uh, had his father had been finance minister for many years. He was the first Iranian to have a doctorate in laws from a European university. He was probably the most educated Iranian of his generation. He became prime minister of Iran in 1951. Now, because he was the product of a democratic process, it was natural that he would have to respond to the will of the Iranian people. And the number one challenge, the overwhelming fact of life for Iranians at that time had to do with oil. Iran is sitting on an ocean of oil. But all of that oil, when Mossadegh came to power, was owned by a British company, which was in turn owned by the British government. So all the standard of living that the British people enjoyed during the 1920s and 30s and 40s was based on oil from Iran. All the factories, the trucks and buses were run on Iranian oil. The Royal Navy, which projected British power around the world, was run 100% on oil from Iran. Meanwhile, the people of Iran were living in some of the most miserable conditions in the world. So it was natural that when you had a democratic leader, who turned out to be Mossadegh, that leader's Number one overwhelming priority would be we have to take back control of our great natural resource. We have to use the profits from the oil to develop our country, not send the oil 
to Britain. It was the decision of the Iranian parliament to nationalize the oil industry that set off the chain of events that led to Mossadegh's overthrow. Yeah, I was actually, um, I was just so impressed at the very end of your book, you talk about going to Mossadegh's uh, house and how you talked to some kids in the street and they knew who he was and they knew he had nationalized oil, which I think really speaks to just how, how much his uh, legacy looms large for people. Because I mean, for a kid to know that, uh, just a random kid you meet on the street, I think that's um, really impressive. Can I ask, but um, you know, uh, like but yeah, the folks who sort of su- who sort of supported oh, yeah. this in the uh, you know in the Iranian street, not actually on the streets protesting, but just sort of you know, the, it, was it um, was it a combination of the middle classes and the working classes? Was there sort of a consensus across Iranian society, or can you sort of play that out for us a little bit? The vote in the Iranian parliament was unanimous in favor of nationalizing the oil. In fact, I'll tell you this little story. Uh, The prime prime minister before Mossadegh had been assassinated, so the parliament had to meet to choose a new prime minister, and all the eyes were on Mossadegh. He was the chairman of the oil committee. He had already been making speeches denouncing British control of Iranian oil. And as it seemed like he was going to be named as prime minister, he stood up and pulled a piece of paper out of his jacket pocket, this would be a great scene if they ever make a movie about this episode, and he essentially said, I will become prime minister, but under one condition. In my hand, I'm holding a proposal that will authorize the government to nationalize our oil resource. First, vote for this, and then make me prime minister, I will implement it. He, I, I absolutely loved uh, the amount of detail that you got into about uh, Mosaddegh's personality. He just, he seems like he was such a showman and honestly kind of a drama queen. I mean, like he continually announced he was quitting politics. He resigned as prime minister, like, and, and that when he actually resigned, I believe over the, um, he was in a feud with the, the Shah over whether he could appoint the minister of war. Uh, everyone basically poured out into the street and insisted that he be returned to power. So it worked out for him. But I, but I love that he, you know, not a compromiser, such a character. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on Most him. Most of that was a fascinating a character. You're absolutely right. And when I was writing my book, All the Shah's Men, I was effectively living with Mossadegh in a kind of a little room for a while. And, and I've had to work, write books about other people that are less pleasant. Uh, But Mossadegh really was a fascinating guy. So as I said, he was an elderly feudal landlord, um, highly sophisticated and educated, but he'd lived many years in Switzerland. And I think maybe he got a little carried away with the democracy of Switzerland. Um, For example, when the CIA sent mobs out onto the streets to try to foment his overthrow, he didn't want to send counter mobs because he thought as a head of state, you don't send mobs onto the street. Um, He, at the very uh, peak of the coup moment, at the the week of the coup when the city of Tehran was in upheaval and turmoil, leaders of the Communist Party came to him and said, give us guns and we will defend your constitutional government. His answer was, if ever I agree to arm a political party, may God cut off my right arm. So he was very uh, faithful to the forms of democracy. He was also extremely honest, which made him quite unique in the uh, Iranian political pantheon. Uh, He was highly frugal. For example, when Kleenex came to uh, Iran, he thought it was a waste that they were double ply, so he would peel them apart and use them one at a time. Uh, he he uh, also, he was, I see no you lie. said he was theatrical. Uh, it's true, uh, and he would sometimes work himself into such a fury when he was making his speeches, denouncing the British and talking about what miserable suffering the Iranian people were going through, he would work himself into such emotion that he'd actually collapse on the floor of parliament. Now, it was never really clear if these collapses were fully physical or if they were partly psychological or even kind of planned out in advance. Um, In the West, this kind of emotional extreme was used to ridicule him. He was called the fainting fanatic. Uh, But in Iran, 
where the depth of genuine emotion is something that plays out in politics as well as in other areas of life, it uh, gave him the air of one of these fundamentalist preachers who whips his flock while urging them on to greatness. And that's what Mossadegh was doing for Iran. Well, so uh, I want to go back a little bit to talk about right after Mossadegh decided, you know, and the parliament voted to nationalize oil. Uh, right away, the British had absolutely no intention of compromising at all um, with the Iranians. They just saw this as like a total violation of their legal rights to the oil. Um, can you talk a little bit about like what the strategies were uh, initially that they were trying to empl employ to get Mossadegh to either come to the table um, or really just get things back to normal with, with them sort of owning the oil legally? It's a very interesting story. And in All the Shah's Men, I try to take the uh, threats and the different means that the British and the Americans tried to use step by step. So as you said, uh, as soon as the oil nationalization uh, was passed in parliament and, and made Iranian law, uh, the British essentially kind of laughed it off. They were used to dealing with what they called the wogs, the, the peasants, the people out there in those faraway colonies. And uh, they never took the, seriously the possibility that they, their position could be threatened. Um, it never had occurred to them that they would not be in Iran forever and that they would not own the oil of Iran forever. It seemed like a permanent fact of life. So the act of parliament was just uh, nothing serious. The first British response when it seemed to be serious was to ask uh, their ambassador in Tehran, how much money did Mossadegh would like to have wired to some Swiss bank account so he would forget this nationalization foolishness? And uh, the ambassador wrote back, that policy is not going to work with Mossadegh for sure, even though it had worked many times for other Iranians and people in other countries where the British exercised their pernicious influence. So the British then embarked on a series of steps, which they said were aimed at assuring their continued ownership of something that was their property right. and preventing the Iranians from stealing something which the British owned by legal contract. That was the British approach. So the first thing the British did uh, was to announce that the refinery, which they had built, it was the biggest refinery in the world, would be closed. Now, the British had promised in their original contract to train Iranian technicians to run the refinery, but they had never complied with that. So the British required all their technicians at the refinery to go home to Britain. Many wanted to stay. And Mossadegh offered them continued pay and benefits, just like they'd been receiving before. But the British wanted to make that refinery stop working. So they required those people to go. They even put ads in newspapers in other countries that had oil industries warning oil experts not to go to Iran and help Iran uh, extract oil because that would be participating in the theft of British property. The British then imposed a naval blockade Jesus. around the Abadan refinery, just in case the Iranians would find some way to extract some oil and put it on a tanker. Then uh, the uh, British imposed what we would today call sanctions. They froze British as uh, Iranian assets in British banks. They stopped exporting some vital uh, goods, everything from concrete to tea. Um, none of that worked. Then the British became really serious, and they started to come up with the idea that they would invade Iran. They would actually stage a military operation, either to overthrow Mossadegh or simply to capture the area where the oil fields and the refinery were. When President Truman heard about this in Washington, he went nuts. And he told the British, that that's absolutely out of the question. You cannot be invading Iran. So then the British decided to take their case to the Security Council of the United Nations. And they wanted the UN to order Iran give back the oil company to its rightful owner, the British. To everybody's shock, Mossadegh in Tehran decided, yeah, I'm going to go to New York. I'm going to go to the UN myself. And he did. Now, this was the first time that the leader of a 
poor resource producing country had ever taken the world stage like this. This was before Castro, before Lumumba, before Nkrumah, before Sukarno. It was the, and Mossadegh carried with him not just the desire of the people of Iran to control their own oil, but the desire of people all over the developing world, new countries that were emerging in Asia and Africa, to control their own resources. And indeed, this was part of the reason why the West was so panicked at what Mossadegh was doing. It's bad enough to lose control of the oil in Iran, but it's even worse to set the example that countries everywhere that produce things that rich countries need can set their own prices and control their own resources. So uh, the United Nations, for the first time in its young history, after hearing from Mossadegh, refused to approve a motion submitted by one of the uh, Security Council permanent members, the British. They wouldn't order Mossadegh to give back uh, the oil company. Then the British took Mossadegh to the World Court in The Hague. They asked the World Court to order Mossadegh to desist. The World Court also refused after hearing from Iranian lawyers. So this left the British in a kind of a panic. Mm. They, they were starting to realize that they could be losing their most valuable asset in the whole world, which is what that refinery was. Uh, then they decided they had to overthrow Mossadegh. So what they did was they had secret agents who were posing as diplomats in Tehran bribe members of the Iranian parliament to prepare them to vote a no-confidence measure, which you can do in any parliamentary democracy. But Tehran was a small town in those days, and the news gets around fast. Mossadegh figured out what was happening, and he did the only thing that he could have done to protect himself, which was to close the British embassy and send home all the British diplomats, among them, of course, all the spies that had been bribing members of parliament. So now the British were naked. They had nothing in Tehran, and they were on the brink of this huge loss, which was unimaginable to them. Yes, and that yes. is when they turned to the Americans. Right. So this was something, uh, the there Americans was a major shift in the it. middle of the book that it, this is something I didn't know anything about. I definitely knew America was involved in the coup, but it was super interesting reading about the differences mm -hmm. between Truman's foreign policy and Eisenhower. So Truman uh, basically kept telling the British, like, look, this is your issue. Like you got to go, you got to come to the table. Sometimes he would uh, send sort of middlemen to try to negotiate between the two parties. But again, neither of them were willing to compromise. Uh, and then when Eisenhower got elected, it was right away. I mean, before he was even in office, he had um, people who were coming into his administration calling up the British being like, yep, let's do this. Let's get him out. Um, and this is where we have uh, some of the most major players in the coup coming onto the scene, Kermit Roosevelt and and the Dulles brothers. So tell us about Kermit and the Dulles brothers and how America sort of became actually central to the coup. It was created in 1947. Um, and he did use the CIA for covert action, but he drew the line at overthrowing governments. He wasn't going to go that far. Um, and... Uh, was explicit, not only in Iran, but also in Guatemala when there was an effort by the CIA to get his approval for overthrowing a government in, in Guatemala. He absolutely refused to do that. So uh, the election of 1952, as you said, brought Dwight Eisenhower uh, into the presidency. More important, it brought uh, John Foster Dulles to the position of Secretary of State and his brother, Alan Dulles, to the position of CIA director. Now, these two had spent much of their career working at the legendary Wall Street law firm of Sullivan and Cromwell. That wasn't a normal law firm, as you think of that term. It was a very specialized operation. And it was designed that the law firm had a specific goal, which was to defend the rights of American corporations working in foreign countries. So every major American corporation that had business abroad had Sullivan and Cromwell as their counsel. And John Foster Dulles was the managing partner for decades at Sullivan and Cromwell. So the defense of American corporate power was central to their ideology. And the only other thing that was that strong was anti-communism. So uh, these made them particularly focused on Mossadegh. Both of them had actually been active in Iran uh, 
and it had one of their major Sullivan and Cromwell engineering projects undermined and killed by Mossadegh and his National Front, who considered this to be an American imposition. So uh, the Dulles brothers came into office gunning for Mossadegh. Actually, according to the last couple of uh, biographies of Eisenhower, he didn't. He came into office without any particular feelings about Mossadegh one way or the other. But the Dulles brothers brought him around to the idea that uh, Mossadegh was hugely dangerous and had to be overthrown. Now, how did this process begin? You, you mentioned quite correctly that the British were so excited at the prospect that they could get something going in Iran and finally get rid of what they called this madman Mossadegh, uh, that they didn't even wait for Eisenhower to be inaugurated. They sent one of their top secret agents to Washington to try to persuade the new incoming group to reverse Truman's policy and agree to help overthrow Mossadegh. Now, this secret agent, uh, Christopher Montague Woodhouse, uh, who was formerly the head of the British Secret Service station in Tehran before Mossadegh closed the embassy, uh, later wrote a memoir, and he devotes a few pages to this uh, mission. And there, I'm going to paraphrase him. He says something like this. As I was flying across the Atlantic, I was thinking to myself, how am I going to propose to the Americans that they should overthrow Mossadegh? I realized that the argument we had been using was not going to work. That argument was, this crazy Mossadegh took away our oil company. Please overthrow him so we can have our oil company back. I realized that argument is not going to move the Americans. But knowing the mood in Washington, I decided that I wasn't even going to mention the word oil. Mm -hmm. I would say this has nothing to do with oil. We must overthrow Mossadegh because he is leading Iran toward communism. communism. <laughs> and that, uh, that, that, that definitely worked. It was the argument that the Dulles brothers used uh, with Eisenhower. And it's peculiar because Mossadegh, as I said, was an elderly feudal landlord who despised all Marxist and socialist ideas. And in fact, we have one moment when this uh, coup proposal is working its way through the American clandestine bureaucracy, where we can see, due to declassified records, that there's a question raised. And the person who raises the question is Eisenhower, who says in one of these National Security Council meetings, first of all, he mutters, I wish there was some way we could get the people in these downtrodden countries to like us instead of hating us. Which, of course, sat, I'm sure it was, didn't sit well with uh, Foster Dulles. Um, but then he said something like, I'm glad to hear we're overthrowing this communist Mossadegh, but I, I, didn't realize, I didn't understand Mossadegh really is a communist. Because, of course, he was the opposite of a communist. And <laughs> Dulles had a great answer. He said, well, of course, you're right. Mossadegh is not a communist. But Mossadegh is old. Mossadegh is sick. He could die. He could be overthrown. Iran has a lot of oil. It's right on the border with the Soviet Union. There's a communist party there. Put all these factors together. It's just too dangerous to let it fester. And that argument was able to win Eisenhower's approval given the intensity of the moment. You cannot understand why this coup was carried out without understanding the Cold War context and uh, using that argument. We are going to prevent the Soviets from uh, extending their power would have won many hearts inside and outside the Eisenhower administration. And this is early on in the Cold War. I mean, can you describe what the Soviet bloc's relationship was towards these events? And, you know, Mossadegh going to New York, could he have, he doesn't like them, but would he have any confidence that perhaps the Soviet Union would veto uh, you know, just to get at the Americans? Or was there, any, was there any kind of Cold War? Or are we actually seeing previews of kind of the non-aligned movement in Mossadegh? Uh, it's very much uh, the latter. So uh, when, when Mossadegh was a, a emerging in power, you had the same kind of movements going on everywhere from Laos and Burma and Indonesia to uh, Ghana and the Congo and Guinea, all over the world, you had these new countries emerging. They had been, um, e either they had been colonies or they had been uh, dominated by foreign powers. Finally, they were deciding that in the modern post-World War II world, 
they were going to establish themselves as independent and they were so focused on developing their countries, which had been left so undeveloped by colonialism, that they didn't want to get involved in the Cold War. They kept saying they wanted to be neutralists. They weren't pro-Moscow, they weren't pro-Washington. This drove John Foster Dulles nuts. He hated neutralists. He actually thought they were worse than communists because he felt that actually they were witting or unwitting agents of international communism, pretending to be simply nationalist reformers waiting for the moment when someone in Moscow would call them and say, today's the day, and then overnight they would turn their country into communism. So Mossadegh definitely was a precursor of the rise of the third world and the desire of uh, developing countries to control their own resources. That is a battle that dominated the Cold War. It's definitely still going on now, but it shows that during the Cold War, there were two ways of looking at the division of the world. The Europeans and the Russians and the Americans looked at it one way. They said the world is divided between the ca capitalist world led by Washington, and on the other side, there's the communist world led by Moscow. But in many parts of the world, that was not the division. The division they saw was on one side, there's the Soviet Union, Europe, and America, all the exploitive European powers. And on the other side, there's the countries of Latin America, of Asia, of Africa, that are struggling against those oppressive powers. We were not able to see the world that way because we were so obsessed in seeing the danger in communism. And that's what led us to uh, misjudge so many of these neutralist leaders who really only wanted what was best for their country, but because they were not pro-American in a global Cold War context, we took them as enemies. Mossadegh was the first, but not the last. Um, as we, <laughs> sorry, I want to talk as we sort of um, move into the last little segment of the interview here, just about the coup itself. So let's say, I'm Kermit Roosevelt. I want to overthrow Mossadegh. What does that look like? Like, how did he, uh, as one man uh, with with many uh, former British agents in the country that he was working with, but what was the process of organizing first the unsuccessful uh, coup and then a couple of days later uh, actually doubling down and successfully ousting Mossadegh? This is a really interesting story because it uh, answers the question that, that you're asking. Essentially, you, you show up in a country, it's Monday morning, first thing, you get to the office, your job is to overthrow the government. So what do you do? What, what do you start with? What's, what's your first project? And your, what's your second project? What do you do? Well, after writing All the Shah's Men, I began to think I know so much about that now, maybe I could hire myself out as a consultant because I, I really understand how to do these things now. So uh, Kermit Roosevelt really was a, a real life James Bond. It's funny because uh, when I was writing All the Shah's Men, I met his son and uh, he told me, you know, it's so strange you say that because my father was a total klutz. He could not change a light bulb. The only thing he was able to do was play tennis. But other than that, he was hopeless. But somehow he, maybe it was the Roosevelt blood, had the uh, flair for overthrowing uh, governments. So what happened was Kermit Roosevelt arrived in Tehran. Uh, one of the first things that he did was begin bribing uh, newspaper publishers and editors and columnists. Within a couple of weeks, he had the majority of the Tehran media on the CIA payroll. Every day there would be articles about Mossadegh being a Jew, a homosexual, a communist, a British agent. It was a constant barrage. In fact, there were so many articles, uh, so, so much demand for these articles uh, that the CIA had to start writing some of them themselves because they couldn't even find enough uh, Iranians to write all these articles. Um, then Kermit Roosevelt bribed uh, religious leaders, mullahs, to denounce Mossadegh from the pulpit as an atheist or an enemy of Islam. Um, he went out and bribed military officers and police units so that they would be ready on the, right, at the right moment. Um, then um, he decided that the way to strike the blow would be this. Uh, Mossadegh was involved in a, a struggle with the Shah. Uh, he had two great goals in his uh, leadership. One was 
nationalism, which meant, in Iran, taking back control of the oil. The other was democracy, which meant, in Iran, that the elected prime minister should rule, and the Shah, the king, should just be kind of a symbol of the nation, like the king or queen of England. Now, the Shah didn't like this idea. So there was constant conflict there. Kermit Roosevelt played on this. And with various uh, efforts, he finally persuaded the timid Shah to agree to sign two royal orders called firmans. And these firmans uh, authorized, or they gave a kind of legal patina to the coup. One was, Mossadegh, you're fired. The other was, I'm naming this other guy, this general that the CIA has chosen named Zahedi, he's going to be my new prime minister. So on the night of the coup, um, a few soldiers loyal to the Shah showed up at Mossadegh's house at midnight. They banged on the door, and the idea was, he's going to come down, we give him the royal order that says, you're fired. He will say, that's not possible, you can't fire me. We will then arrest him, and we will claim he's resisting authority. But it didn't work out that way. What happened was that Mossadegh had gotten wind of the coup plot, and he had loyal soldiers waiting in the darkness. And as soon as the coup plotters showed up, they were seized. So the people who had come to arrest Mossadegh were themselves arrested. The next day, the news came out, coup is foiled, the Shah fled the country, turns, he flees to Iraq and then on to Rome, thinks he's never coming back, uh, the coup has failed, and even in... Even at the CIA, there was a feeling that the uh, coup probably had failed, and it was time for Kermit Roosevelt to come home. But he didn't do that. He felt he could still make this work. He still had weapons that he hadn't used. So here's what he did in those final days. Um, the first thing he did was something that I might have thought of, too. He hired a street gang. Uh, full of toughs and violent men, and he told them, I want you to run through the streets, I want you to break shop windows, fire your guns into the mosques, uh, beat up people on the street, and yell, we love Mossadegh and communism. But what he did even beyond that, that I wouldn't have thought of, is he hired a second mob to attack the first mob he had hired. So within a day or two, Tehran was totally consumed with street fighting and protesting. Uh, gangs were fighting each other, not realizing that they were both in the pay of the CIA. And Mossadegh, with his commitment to democracy, refused to crack down fiercely on these demonstrations. And finally, at the end of that week, uh, Kermit Roosevelt mobilized military units whose commanders he had bribed. They closed in on Mossadegh's house. There was a gun battle that went on for several hours. Several hundred people were killed. And on that night, Mossadegh was overthrown. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it was really, it's such a shocking and... Um uh, telling story and, and you told it really well in your book. Um, I did want to, before we get to the end of the interview, just briefly touch on the, some of the consequences later down the road. Uh, one of the things you just mentioned was that the Shah, you know, after the first failed coup attempt, he got on his private plane and he ran away. You know, he, I, I actually was surprised to learn how, what a like nervous kind of unsure character he was. He wasn't really behind it. He just sort of got, eventually pushed into it by uh, the CIA. And also his sister was like very interested in this uh, concept of overthrowing Mossadegh. Um, but so he he came back. Um, and actually, there was a funny anecdote in your book about uh, when he heard that Mossadegh's government actually had fallen a couple days later, he yelled, oh, I knew they loved me. Like he, he didn't seem to know that uh, everyone had been paid <laughs> to be a part of this. Um, but so he comes back and then uh, eventually, in the 1979 Islamic Revolution, he has to flee the country. The Shah um, is a, a given safe passage to the U.S. And so in your book, the, the line you drew that I thought was super interesting was that right after that is when um, Americans are taken hostage in the embassy. And your point was that, well, Iranians remembered that it, uh, in 1953, the Shah fled the country and 
two days later, their Democratic leader was overthrown and he came back. So their feeling was, well, if the Shah gets away and he's not here and he's not facing justice, it's likely the Americans are going to come and overthrow our government again, basically. This is a really great object lesson that comes out of the story of, of the Mossadegh coup in 1953. Uh, that coup was a success. We got what we wanted. We overthrew a guy we didn't like, Mossadegh, and we replaced him with a guy, the Shah, who would do everything we said. So it seemed like the perfect outcome. And it would have been if only history stopped. But history doesn't stop. History keeps on happening. And the long-term effects of these interventions are often disastrous. If you want to prove that point, Iran is one of your best examples. So just take a, a brief look at how the effects uh, of the 1953 coup spun out. As you said, after the CIA managed to overthrow Mossadegh, uh, they brought uh, the Shah back. He ruled with increasing repression for the next 25 years. That repression produced the explosion of the late 1970s, what we call the Islamic Revolution. Uh, that revolution brought to power a group of fanatically anti-American mullahs who have spent the last 40 years intensely and sometimes quite violently working against American interests all over the Middle East and all over the world. Um, it was also the Islamic Revolution that set off the hostage crisis, as you uh, referred to. So uh, the hostage crisis was seen in the United States and still, I think, is seen by many Americans as examples of how uncivilized and how barbaric the Iranians are. By seizing an embassy, they broke every law of God and man, and they did it for no reason. They simply right. did it because they uh, want to destroy. They're just hateful people. Um, and so uh, we didn't know any more at the time that would help us understand that episode. But since then, several of the hostage takers have written their own memoirs, and there they all say the same thing. It, it wasn't nihilism or anti-Americanism that drove us to do this. It was something very specific. We remembered 1953. What happened then? The people of Iran threw the Shah out. He fled. But CIA agents working in the basement of the US embassy organized a coup, and they brought the Shah back, and the dictatorship continued. Now here we are in 1979. The Shah has been forced to flee again, the same Shah. Now he's going to the United States. We presume that CIA agents working in the basement of the U.S. Embassy are going to do the same thing they did last time. We don't, we, in one of the wrote, we did this in order to prevent history from repeating itself. But Americans didn't see it that way because we didn't know about that right. first history. At the time of the hostage crisis, no one had any idea in the United States of what had happened in 1953. So the effects of that coup, however, didn't stop there. Um, the uh, overthrow of the Shah was one of those rare uh, geopolitical events in the Cold War that terrified both sides. The Americans hated it, of course, because we lost our great uh, uh, pawn there, the Shah, but the Soviets also hated it. They saw this as a triumph of radical Islam, and of course the Soviet Union was composed largely of these republics along the southern border, all Muslim dominated. So they were terrified at the idea of radical Islam coming into the Soviet Union. It was partly to prevent that, that the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. That's what brought the United States into Afghanistan and brought us into that whole long mess which we're now trying to extricate ourselves from. And it still doesn't even end there. After the Shah was overthrown and Iran was in upheaval after the 1979 revolution, who should notice this but Iran's greatest longtime enemy, Saddam Hussein in next door Iraq. He decided this is a great time to invade Iran. And that's what he did. In 1983, uh, the uh, Iraq invaded, uh, I'm sorry, in 19, yeah, in, in, he invaded Iran and then the United States decided we hate Iran so much that we're going to support Saddam Hussein. And the president of the United States sent an emissary to meet with Saddam Hussein. He went twice to ask Saddam Hussein, what can we do for you? How can we help you? That emissary was none other than Donald Rumsfeld, who later went on to become the mastermind of the Iraq invasion. So it was that moment that 
made us a partner of Saddam Hussein, brought us into that death embrace that spiraled down into the catastrophe of the invasion and everything that followed. So a lot of history came out of three weeks <laughs> in the summer of 1950. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's why, you know, that's why we wanted to have you on the show to tell us a little bit about this, like, insanely, uh, historically, um, you know, just insanely historical uh, few weeks in Iran. And um, again, before we go, the book is All the Shah's Men. We hope people will check it out uh, and and get to read in more detail about what happened. But it's just super important that we, uh, especially us Americans, uh, know about this history so we can understand current events in the Middle East that much better. So so thank you so much, Stephen, for, for joining us. It was great. Great to be with you. Thanks. <laughs>